Hello, I'm Dr. John Cruz. I'm the author of Recognizing Adult ADHD. And today I'm going to be talking about ADHD across the lifespan, or I'll be talking for less than 20 minutes. This will be available on Facebook, on my Facebook channel after we speak. I'm open to questions. If you have them, you can type them in while I'm talking, or if you come up with questions later, I can answer them that site. This will also be transferred to my YouTube channel, Dr. John Cruz, and you can ask questions there as well. So, first of all, ADHD does occur across the lifespan. Um, when I was in training, we believed that it was a childhood disorder, even though I went to a good residency program in psychiatry in four whole years of training. There was not a single mention that ADHD could be um, present in adults. Part of why I got interested and involved in working with adults with ADHD was the very first patient that was referred to me after residency was someone who had worked with a well-respected um, Freudian analyst for seven years, a sort of man in his early 40s. The, Psychiatrist said, I've made no progress with this guy in seven years. He's bright, he's personable, but he doesn't seem to learn anything. Um, could he possibly have ADHD? And he actually referred him to the university setting. The man had three days of neuropsych testing, and they said, gee, his test profile looks like he could be someone with ADHD, but that doesn't exist in adults, so who knows what he has? And after working with the guy and realizing over multiple sessions that there wasn't PTSD or depression or anxiety as the core cause, and he had a full and extremely severe and robust set of ADHD symptoms is what opened my eyes to this is clearly a condition that occurs and continues a lot across the lifespan for many. So for some researchers and some clinicians, some of them even define ADHD as a delay in maturation, that there seem to be both a host of behavioral patterns and um, anatomical studies looking at the brain suggest that the brains, certainly in kids with ADHD, show patterns of delayed development, that part of growing up is parts of the cortex of your brain actually grow thinner. You lose neurons over time. Ones that aren't used as much are weeded out. Some of that cortical thinning seems delayed by a few years in kids with ADHD. Again, a host of behavioral symptoms would be normal for a younger kid, but are abnormal, or we consider them abnormal and hence worthy of an ADHD diagnosis and actually built into the formal definition when it describes the behaviors that are inattentive, impulsive, um, it specifically says that these behaviors are inappropriate for that age. Um, and interestingly, there have been a few studies in recent years looking at children and those children who are the youngest ones in their classroom. I mean, ages, children are born around the calendar year, and yet we force them to join a certain cohort every year so that some kids are almost a year older than other kids in their class and in many classes. Kids are either held back or pushed up a little, so there's actually fairly often more than a year's range of ages in a given class, but very consistently, kids who are in the youngest members of their class are substantially more likely to receive an ADD diagnosis. Again, some of this is probably misdiagnosis, that they're mistaking simple immaturity for ADD-like immaturity. Um, so I'm not saying that ADHD is only immaturity and but we do consider it a neurodevelopmental condition. Um, we know there's a strong genetic component, but again, the genetic component is not just one or two genes. It's you inherit versions of hundreds, if not thousands of genes, which increase your propensity for developing ADHD. But we know from twin studies, for example, where identical twins with identical genetic makeup are not always concordant, are not always both having it or both not having it. Fairly often we see one with it and one not. Um, the other, so we also know that in utero exposure, so there have been recent flurry of studies and it's some media attention about mothers taking um, 
acetaminophen, Tylenol, that seems to actually, a single use isn't going to affect it, but habitual use during pregnancy seems to increase the risk. We know maternal smoking seems to increase the risk of the child developing ADHD. There seem to be a number of um, pesticides and industrial agricultural toxins which seem to increase the risk for a kid if, who's exposed in utero to developing ADHD. We know that just prematurity, um, early delivery, seems to increase the risk for ADHD. So there's a host of, as pretty much everything else in human behavior or psychology, there's a mixture of biology and social forces or environment that also have a role. Um, so we know six to ten percent of kids in America are diagnosed with a meatful criteria for ADHD. That does not seem to differ too widely across different cultures or countries if you same, use the same tools to measure it. Certainly different cultures and communities have different approaches as what to do with ADHD kids in U.S. culture. It probably has a lot to learn from some of these others. In addition to the <clears throat> 6 to 10% of kids who have full-blown ADHD, there's probably close to an equal number of kids who are somewhere on the spectrum of having some degree, but maybe not enough um, criteria to meet full ADHD diagnosis. In adults, so what we know, so one substantial lifetime issue is that not all kids with ADHD wind up having it as adults. It seems that my numbers are ballpark figures, but I think it's better to use ballpark figures and pretend we have high degrees of accuracy when predicting these things. So about a third of kids with ADHD seem to have the same degree of ADHD as they grow up. Another th third seem to outgrow it completely, so they don't have ADHD as adults. And the middle third gets somewhat better, but still have some degree of ADHD-ness as adults. Um, one of the things that may play a factor in who which kids outgrow it or not. So this is, spec I'll, I'll try to separate what's speculative and what we know. What we know, and we have more than three dozen studies of kids with ADHD who are treated with stimulants compared to kids with ADHD who are not treated with stimulants. And there are a number of parents, a number of practitioners even, who strongly recommend against stimulants for kids with ADHD out of fear of uncommon but really bad outcomes like addiction, like psychosis, like um, sudden cardiac death, which is extremely rare. And the extrapolation from them, that is that these are bad drugs and they rot kids' brains and you shouldn't be on them. So the data from more than three dozen studies is that of the kids who took stimulants as youngsters for their ADHD, more than 35 of the studies show those kids have brains that looked more normal at the end of adolescence than the kids who didn't. So that may flip the story completely on its head. So by depriving your kid of stimulants during ADHD, uh, by, uh, by depriving your kid with ADHD of stimulants while they're growing up, it's possible, and again, this is speculative, but the, the data is strongly supportive of this, is that you may be sentencing your kid to a lifetime of ADHD rather than the possibility they may have been one of the kids who outgrew their ADHD. Because again, at least brains look more normal for kids who got ADHD during their developmental years. So some people, neuroplasticity is sort of one of the buzzwords of the last decade that Brains do change even as you get older. Um, clearly, if you practice things, if you develop new habits, if you learn new information, all of that is dependent on making new or strengthening preferentially different neural connections in the brain. So adult brains can change, but there's also, that doesn't mean they have the same neuroplasticity or the same range of possibilities for growth or change that young developing brains do. And we have something that are called critical periods where we know if a brain doesn't get certain input at certain stage of development, they may never develop a certain um, function. Um, some of that was studied decades ago and was Nobel Prize winning 
research by Hubel and Weasel who studied development of vision and in kittens who had their eyes closed for weeks at a time, depending on what phase in development that could prevent that eye from effectively seeing if it was later unsutured. You open the eye and allow the eye to see it's no longer able to connect to the proper brain regions and work. Um, but again, the critical period means there's a specific period of time those connections need to be made, and if you don't make them, then they can't be made at all. So some amount of change or difference may well be locked in. Um, some amount may be changeable later on, and we don't know the extent to which is which. So um, related to the topic of ADHD trajectory over life is the big question about is there such thing as adult onset ADHD? And the really simplistic answer is no, it's impossible. Why do I say it's impossible? I say it's impossible because the official ADHD diagnosis is you had to have symptoms before the age of 12. It used to be before the age of seven. So by the official definition, nobody develops ADHD as an adult. A more serious or fundamental question is can you develop an ADHD-like picture as an adult and I would say there are certain people with specific head traumas, probably primarily head traumas to the frontal lobes, who have pictures that look, I would argue, indistinguishable symptomatically and actually who often get positive responses to stimulant medication. So I would say a subset of head trauma, I would consider this is effectively an ADHD picture, whether certain patterns of excessive drug abuse can also lead to brain changes which look like ADHD is possible. I'm also a believer, both from what I see clinically and how I interpret the research, that the vast number of people who claim, oh, I didn't have ADHD as a kid, but now I have it now, really did probably have it as a kid. So I'll use one anecdotal report, and I think I mentioned him in my book, I, I frequently pick on this guy. So someone I first saw four or five years ago, he was in his 50s, he was starting his third um, tech startup company. He had made millions with his first two, um, but a company sort of blew up in terms of disagreements and battles with his co-founders and people who pushed him out. He was, third company was seemingly heading toward the same trajectory, and he came in specifically for help with explosive temper. Didn't ADHD hadn't occurred to him, didn't, didn't even know it could exist in adults. At the end of our first two hours of evaluation, he was sort of flabbergasted when I outlined a whole host of inattentive and hyperactive and impulsive ADHD symptoms that he classically fit. And he you know, listened to them thoughtfully. He agreed that maybe they did fit, but his interpretation was maybe that was all just the stress of this third company you know, maybe being on the edge of blowing up again. So I told them, you know, why don't you go back between now and our next time and talk to your family members and see what they viewed of you as a, you know, growing up. And he did this, and he was from a large family. Um, he was one of eight siblings, and he talked to them, and every one of them said, well, use a fake name. No, Joe, this is exactly how you were as a kid. You were always cutting people off. You were always interrupting. You always had an explosive temper. You were always distracted. You were smart. You were successful, but all these ADHD symptoms were there. And so for him, this was both sort of eye-opening and grateful. And, you know, as he worded it, not my wording, he said, I had thought for years that I was just an asshole, but and learning that it's ADHD and learning that there are things he could do to mitigate some of his ADHD symptoms was powerful. But again, he, he is an anecdote of someone who would absolutely have sworn, no, I didn't have ADHD as a child, I didn't have it growing up, it just showed up now. Um, so there have been a number of different studies um, looking at children who are in, who are studied in clinical set, in clinical research studies for their ADHD and then were reassessed usually in the early 20s. So none of these are even waiting till 40s or waiting till 70s to, to retrospectively evaluate. And this is a, a rough approximation, but about 20 to 40% of these people in their 20s, when asked about their ADHD symptoms or if they ever had a diagnosis, 
15, 20 years ago, their ADD, 20 to 40% of them completely deny having had childhood ADHD. And maybe some of them are you know, shameful or consciously lying. I think that's a pretty tiny minority. Um, again, many of them are still having ADHD symptoms as adults. I think a far bigger proportion of them, again, part of ADHD is inattentiveness, not monitoring yourself, your brain as well as other people might. Um, so if you're not registering it, if you're not remembering it, if you're sort of more focused on what's in front of you and what's interesting, you are missing information and misremembering and misforgetting information. So I think the vast majority of people who are diagnosed with adult onset really have had ongoing ADHD that was either misdiagnosed, unrecognized, or or they had coping mechanisms that got them through it. So again, the, the topic today is more trans, you know, ADHD through the lifespan and what's it look like or what it's, um, again, most of our data suggests a third of kids seem to outgrow it, but by the early 20s, the, the, the current dogma, and this may change as we learn more, is that the amount or degree of ADD-ness of your brain is probably fairly fixed by young adulthood. Um, on the other hand, as I said earlier, ADHD, all of our mental health issues are always an interaction between bi nature and nurture, biology and social construct. So there are certain transition periods where it's particularly likely someone's ADHD is to lead them to more problems or difficulties or they're likely to show up for diagnosis for the first time. Um, and specifically, those are transitions where there's either a greater demand on brain skills or there's a decreased amount of structure in them. So one is a transition between high school and college. There's, I've seen several kids who are bright enough to get into Stanford or Ivy League schools and are failing out of them. In this day and age, you only get into those places if you did really well in tests, you had really good um, grades and you probably had lots of extracurriculars, but the other kids were failing out. Clearly, it's not because they're stupid. Um, almost always, it's they don't have the structure of either parents or someone in the home saying, you will do your homework tonight and checking up. And maybe it's some high schools also giving kids more lenience or more flexibility in being late, handing things in on time. So on, in college where there's parties and there's people to talk to and nobody's telling you when to go to bed or no one's checking whether you do your homework. Some of these kids are failing out. Again, the ADHD isn't worse. It's just causing them more problems, more difficulty navigating the structure they're in. Second transition period where I see ADHD showing up. Again, it's not that it's showing up brand new. It's just people are running into more problems with it is a transition from college to the work field or workforce. So even though college itself is less hand-holding and less structured than the work, in fact, for many people, it's structured enough. You have a semester's worth of courses. You have ABC courses. You have homework assignments. You have um, people telling you when things are due and sometimes even asking for rough drafts or other things. So there are more benchmarks along the way. And at least in some workplaces, you are sort of after some initial onboarding or instruction, you're left on your own. And particularly since we do a lousy job across corporate, this is a gross overgeneralization, but training managers or training people on how to teach others to do their job, many people are finding themselves both the demands have gone up and the structure has gone down. Um, so that's a time people show up for ADHD diagnosis. And not to overemphasize, we so often overemphasize with ADHD that it's sort of an intellectual, a cognitive, a learning problem. It's either failing in school or failing in work, but this is something with clear, robust, detrimental social implications. So another time um, people with ADHD show up for treatment and diagnosis is when they transition from being a single person to being in a couple and or that can include living with others and or starting a family. So again, demands are way up and structure sometimes is decreased, but usually there it's that the demands are up, that 24 seven they have to figure out ways of being with people when maybe in isolated bouts, they could be um, charismatic 
exciting, entertaining, excited, and are less good on the follow-up and follow-through. And then what surprises people the most, the other time I see people retiring is, well, I just gave it away, showing up for a diagnosis for ADHD, is retirement. People say, why the heck should that happen? There's nothing to do except enjoy yourself. Well, for many people, work provides structure, it provides expectations, it provides meaning, it fills your hours. And for many people with ADHD, they are highly overrepresented among the people who didn't plan ahead, who didn't develop hobbies or other activities, and suddenly they have the whole day ahead of them, and what am I going to do? I could do that, I could do this, I could spend time there. But no one else is telling them what to do, and as I say frequently, free time is your enemy if you have ADHD. So retirement is often a time people can show up. So I've certainly seen people in their 70s presenting for the very first time or ADHD and my record, and I just made it this month and I know I shouldn't be competitive or silly this way, um, but I just evaluated a 99 year old guy who absolutely gives a detailed um, history of underperforming his intellectual and sort of social skills. So he had multiple careers, he failed out of school where his brother got multiple degrees, um, multiple relationships, scattered life. He's an entertaining, wonderful guy and has been diagnosed with anxiety before, but never ADHD. I'm virtually certain that is his actual main problem over the last 90, plus years of his life. So one question that that overlaps with this gentleman, there's no question of um, dementia, but there's a question or difficulty of the overlap between ADHD and dementia. Both of these are processes that are primarily affecting executive function and distinguishing what's a memory issue from what's an attention issue can be tricky. So lots of people, you know, I was making dinner the other day and I started to put the uh, pot in the refrigerator or I opened the refrigerator door and I didn't have a clue which of the three ingredients I was looking for and stood there blankly. Most people when they do something like that will say I'm having memory problems and yes this is short term memory. Usually with dementia we're seeing more long term or consolidation of real memory issues so people unable to recall loved ones or things they said the other day. With ADHD, again, I, somewhere similar complaints are more often tied to attention in the moment and not registering or not being mindful or conscious of what they are doing. Um, so again, diagnosis can get tricky. So two other things I, I talked earlier about, you know, the, the limits of neuroplasticity as someone gets older. But the question is sort of, if I'm a 20 year old, am I always doomed to be taking the same amount of medicine throughout my whole life? Will I always be reliant on it? And even without neuroplasticity or major neuroplasticity, part of the answer I'd say is no. So one thing, and maybe this does actually overlap with neuroplasticity, but we know that people can practice habits, you know, even if they're not in formal training. Many people with ADHD develop little tools, little techniques, you know, learn to always put their keys on the hook by the door when they come in, learn on ways to minimize distraction, of not going to bed with their phone. Um, so many people on their own, or even more specifically and forcefully with specific training, can learn tools and ways that help minimize the impact of ADHD on their life. So they change habits to, again, minimize distractions, help boost their own structure or organization. And a separate factor in terms of what your future with ADHD is like is finding the right niche for you. So if you have ADHD, probably a, a job in a structure that's too constraining, too refining, you're probably not gonna do well on the Tesla assembly line, screwing one bolt in day after day. And actually the machines do most of that but something that's extremely boring, repetitive, and allows no creativity divergence is probably not a good match. On the other hand, unless you have good support or administrative backup, something that's completely open-ended, freewheeling, and creative, 
may also run into problems with lack of productivity or direction or, or accountability in ADHD. So people, though, who find a job that fits their interests and find the right amount of structure within that type of field are ones who tend to do well with their ADHD or ones who make a career out of switching careers every few years. And you might even put Donald Trump in that category. You know, for years he was just in daddy's business of real estate exploitation and management, um, but then he branched off into you know, luxury goods, many of which tanked horribly, some of which succeeded. Um, then he branched into politics without any training or expertise or knowledge and failed to gain much of that in the course of his years, but was successful enough at one conventional level of getting elected at least once to being president. So the traditional view that one should have a career and stay in one job for 50 years, my whole economy is shifting away from that, but particularly for people with ADHD, that may not be a particularly useful model for them. So that's my talk about ADHD across the lifespan. I'm not seeing any questions that have come in, but if you post more later, I'm happy to answer them. Next week's topic is gonna be a little more directly practical, I hope, and hands-on. It's called coping with being overwhelmed. So that's all. Stay healthy, stay happy, and I'll be here next Friday at 11.